Welcome everyone to the Career Readiness and Job Placement Team's Career Conversations webinar series. This is our first session this semester brought to you by the Strategic Partnerships and Workforce Development Division. My name is Renee Liang and I'm the Job Placement Coordinator for Arts, Language and Communication. Um, I would love for the rest of the Career Readiness and Job Placement Team here today to introduce themselves to. We have Alexa, Laura and Brittany. Hi everyone, my name is Alexa Moore. I'm the Job Placement Coordinator for Society and Education. And it's a pleasure to see all of you here today. And thank you to our wonderful speakers for coming. I'm super excited to hear how this con career conversation is gonna go. Hi, my name is Laura DiCaleda and I'm the Job Placement Coordinator for Business Entrepreneurship and Management. And Alexa stole my words. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation and excited to have with all of you guys and our wonderful speakers, so. And I am Brittany Steed. I am the Job Placement Coordinator supporting Science, Technology, and Health, along with assisting the Women's Mentoring Leadership Academy. And it's so good to see um, new and the usual faces. Thank you. And in honor of Women's History Month, today we will be chatting about the topic of planning for career success and upward mobility with some amazing women in leadership. And I am extremely excited to introduce to you all the panelists that we have that will be sharing the expertise in this particular topic. But before I begin, I would like to thank everyone in attendance today and also to those of you that are watching this later on as this will be recorded. Thank you to the panelists, our team and the audience for taking the time out of your busy schedules and making this webinar possible. And a special thank you to um, WIMLA, the Women's Mentoring and Leadership Academy. And um, Brittany is here to, for, to talk a little bit about WIMLA um, and about what this program is about. So Brittany. I, uh, I think maybe I'll kind of explain it towards the end, but the Women's Mentoring and Leadership Academy has been on the Skyline campus for about six years now. And it's a place for women to open up, be themselves, um, grow, and um, find like a comprehensive way to get through um, college and life, not just, you know, focusing on studies. And we're just so glad that to have this community. <laughs> yes, and WIMLA meets every week. So it's really great to have this community of women just supporting each other and um, having these different conversations and uh, meetings just to check in with each other. So this is really great. And we have some amazing professionals here with us in the Zoom room. Um, I would like to introduce Jackie Trung, the brand managing, the brand marketing partnerships lead at Google and Linda Walubengo, the senior program manager of engineering at LinkedIn. And Alexa, Laura, Brittany, and I will facilitate this webinar. And we would like to begin by asking our expert-led panel to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Jackie, can you please start us off? Sure. Thanks, Renee. And thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm super excited to be invited and, and have such an awesome community of women looking out for each other and at school and through their lives. I think it's super important. Um, so I, I work at Google now. I've been out of college for a little too long, probably close to 10 years. I went to San Diego State. I was actually really excited to speak with some students a few weeks ago. And um, a lot of questions came up around how I kind of went through different things as a woman and as a queer person through my pro professional life. And I'm so excited to be able to talk through different topics with you all. And, um, you know, I've had experience from a startup that had 10 people to Google who has like 150,000 employees. So there's a lot that I've been through and would love to share and find a way to give back to the community however I can. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Jackie. And Linda, can you also tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I share the same uh, words of gratitude from Jackie. It is an honor to be here and get to meet new friends and see familiar faces. So thank you for this opportunity. I, I'm hoping to learn. I'm sure I will learn a lot from just being here as well. So let's let's do it together. My name is Linda Walubengo. I um, currently work at LinkedIn, but my past um, career 
my journey is very interesting. I was in the nonprofit sector for about nine years before navigating into tech. So the, some of the topics that uh, Renee sent over um, resonate so very well with me as a Black woman uh, working in, in different environments. Um, I'm originally from Kenya, born and raised. I came to this country in 2003. So um, there's also, you know, that piece as an immigrant that um, plays a key role in, in who I am and the intersectionality of um, being a woman in this, in, in working in, in all industries. So um, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Linda. And now I would like to hand it over to Alexa to get into the topic of discussion today. Thank you, Renee, and thank you, um, Linda and Jackie, uh, for sharing a little bit about yourself as well, um, some background information about yourselves. So planning for career success and upward mobility is a really important topic to consider, especially as you move through your career for more job security and um, move through valuable different experiences that actually lead you to landing your ultimate dream job. So we will have a Q&A session, but if at any point or time, one of um, the lovely people in our audience would like to ask a question, please feel free to um, either, you know, raise your hand if you, if you like to speak, or you can definitely type it into the chat box as we will be monitoring that as well. And I'm gonna start with Jackie, if you could be so kind to just kick us off and telling us your thoughts on when you first started in your career and how did you go through about planning to grow within your career? Yeah, so without doing such a long monologue of kind of my resume, I would say, you know, I started um, at San Diego State in business. I found that I wanted to go into marketing because I had an interest in kind of psych psychology and sociology but I was also kind of into creative and design. And I knew that I wasn't good enough as a designer to be a designer in my career, but I had some business savviness to enough kind of go to go down that route. So I had a lot of uncles and aunts who were entrepreneurs and I found that to be super inspirational. And um, so I wanted to kind of beef up my business rapport and figure out like if there was a career path in that. Um, and I've had a job since I was in, you know, in high school from, 15 and a half and I can get a work permit. I had to pay for everything on my own. So I knew like right away that I figured out a lot of things in sales and business and merchandising, working in retail. And through college, I also had an internship with, if you know, the Snack Pirates Booty, that was like the only internship that I could get at the time. And it was paid and I needed a paid internship, which I know a lot of folks can relate to, like you can't just go and work for free all the time. So that was something that while I didn't think that would ever lead to my career at Google, it de definitely helped me understand like what I liked about sales and client relations and account management. Um, I learned that in my very first job. So I think starting there and then um, right out of school, I was really struggling to find that first dream job in my mind. I was like, I'm gonna work at an ad agency. I'm gonna be around creative directors and designers. And it was really hard. It was 2011 and we were also in a recession at that time. And um, there was a lot of different competition for like, you know, jobs at that entry level point. So I had to kind of find my way through, um, you know, part-time positions and internships. And uh, I found a role at a startup in LA that was, you know, 15 people. And, you know, I got to work very closely with the CEO and, and other co-founder to really figure out what their marketing strategy was. Even though I was freshly out of school, they were super open to new ideas. And one of the things that I was good at, at the time was technology. And I worked at the Apple store right before that job. So the job actually was all about mobile marketing. And so I leaned into my expertise around mobile marketing. And while that sounds kind of not that innovative at the time it was. And so I kind of started specializing in mobile marketing. And in my next job at EA, the recruiter had reached out to me because my LinkedIn and resume had so much um, specialized information around mobile marketing and emerging devices that they needed to, some, needed to find someone with that background. So that opportunity came up because I was able to kind of, you know, elaborate on that online and have a portfolio around projects in that space. Um, and then, 
you know, Netflix came to be uh, an opportunity once one of my friends, um, my friends knew that I worked in mobile marketing and knew I had a lot of partnerships with like Apple and Android and Microsoft that Netflix was looking for someone who actually worked in that space as well. Um, and we just hit it off when I met them and it kind of happened organically. I didn't even apply through the website. Um, and this was back when House of Cards was like their only original series and they still delivered a lot of DVDs. Um, and, you know, I spent a good chunk of my time there and uh, six years later down the road, you know, I helped them launch in a lot of different countries. I moved to Singapore because they didn't have an office there and we needed to figure out how to launch in Asia. And I just, what I felt like my career path was just kind of going down this road of this is coming up, this opportunity is here, I'm good at this, someone hasn't done this before, let's take some risks. I just kind of kept moving forward. And I don't think that I knew that I would be here 10 years ago. Um, I think I probably would have thought I would be some sort of, you know, art director, creative director in some way down the road. But I'm happy to kind of find that, you know, I got to kind of marry a lot of different things I was interested in, but also just let let your managers and teams give you opportunities as you grow through your career as well. So that's kind of how I found my way to where I am today, but I don't think it's a linear path. I definitely think I made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot of things on the way as well. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, two things that really, you know, stood out to me through your, you know, entire amazing journey of where you're getting to today is um, that you mentioned getting paid for your work, because I feel like that's super important, like paid internships and just getting paid, right, because you should be valued for the work that you're doing. Um, and also how you mentioned LinkedIn. So I've become a super fan of LinkedIn. I think it's super great. I think everyone should have it. And it's so inspiring to hear that, like someone, we always tell people that, um, you know, it's possible recruiters can reach out to LinkedIn. It's just to, to actually hear someone's story, say, hey, someone reached out to me and I got a job through, you know, a connection on LinkedIn is like pretty super exciting for me. So thank you for sharing all of that. Um, Linda, would you please give us some insight too on your how you started in your career and um, how you plan to grow within your career as well or how that growth kind of happened? Yeah, <laughs> Jackie, you took me back to House of Cards. Oh my goodness, I need to rewatch it. It's been a minute, such a great show. Um, so I, my journey has been very, very interesting. I, this is my first tech experience. I have never worked in tech before, but I generally believe that um, it's, I think anyone in any industry who has skills and can interact with people and can problem solve, those skills are transferable. Right. And so I'm a product of that whole experience, as well as someone who like I got I reached out to a recruiter on LinkedIn and they responded to me. And that this was the only job I reached out for. And I, I ended that's why I'm here um, working for the company. So major and I'm not it's not a plug at all. Like I my emails, I just used to send out emails to people. Um, so my background is um, uh, I, I too studied clinical psychology in undergrad and I thought that I was going to be a child psychiatrist. That's all I wanted to do. But um, growing up in Kenya, I also was really fascinated by public health efforts just in general. So the first part of my career in education, I went in and got my master's in public health because I was adamant that I wanted to work for WHO or UN. I mean, just typical, it's a majority of folks from Kenya, like it's ingrained, like you, you, the UN is like the end goal for jobs, you know, at least back then. Right now, it's definitely everyone's like, get into tech. Um, so that was my goal. And I, I got into um, a lot of, I had a lot of great opportunities working with the HIV community uh, back in East Africa while I was finishing school and then ended up in the Bay Area working with some phenomenal organizations in San Francisco and growing so fast. I mean, that growth within six months, I was like overseeing programs and teams and it was just really quick and um, because I was very passionate about what I was doing. And I think 
people see that and they're like, this, this person is thirsty for more. And so I did that for a while. I, you know, was a event director for AIDS Walk in New York and the Bay Area. I mean, it was just, I was on this like massive growth. And one day, you know, it, it was like, what now, what do I do? You know, it's like the next goal was go into running an organization. And that was not, I, I just didn't feel like I wanted to be a CEO for a nonprofit. I don't know if folks on the call have worked in nonprofits. It's very hard. It's a very challenging space to be because you don't have resources. You're working, you're wearing multiple hats. I mean, it's just, it became, and I'd done it at that point for about nine years. So I was just I was burnt out, to be honest, and I wanted a challenge. I wanted something new. And so I started looking um, online to see what else I could do. And I I started using LinkedIn in 2010 as part of like the grad school class. They, They asked us like, open your LinkedIn, like open your computer and get something called LinkedIn and sign up and use it. So I've been using LinkedIn since like, back then and networking has always that's like if anyone you know they always ask you like what's your superpower as corny as that question is like legit mine is networking so that's how I got to as far as I I am and that's my goal you know moving forward is just meeting people talking to them getting to put putting yourself out there pretty much like it works wonders. A lot of things that have happened in my life are because somebody remembers a conversation they had with me at some event or on, on a call or something. Um, back when we used to, working nonprofit, they used to have all these galas to fundraise. And I would just be talking up a storm with every single person. And on Monday, it'd be like, oh, Linda, can you come and do this? let's bring Linda to do that. So I I, I got an opportunity to work on like um, child trafficking initiatives here in the Bay Area. I got an opportunity to go to DC and and do some phenomenal work in in, um, uh, uh, helping uh, uh, sex workers. And, And I mean, my background is just very different in that sense. And um, 2019, I was like, well, it's time for a change. Um, and I wanted to work for a place that had helped me. And so it made sense that LinkedIn would be that place because I'd utilized the, the platform for such a long time. Um, and so that kind of worked out that transition, but I took a huge leap, you know, it's very like from nonprofit into tech, it's like culture shock. It's like equivalent to when I landed in America in 2003. It's just like, what is going on? Um, Just the idea of, and I joined right before the pandemic. So I had a couple of months, at least a year to experience this whole tech industry, which to me is very different from what I'm used to, right? Like the lunches and getting a card to take you to work. I just was like, whoa, you mean we're not gonna get leftovers? We're actually getting what? Um, So, I'm still in it. I'm still in it. And I am um, very grateful constantly. Um, And I'm curious, uh, how do we provide this opportunity to other people? Because I think that for me, for a long time, I used to think this industry is unattainable, and I'm just going to stick in my lane. And I think what we're noticing is that um, across all industries, like there is a significant lack of diversity and there are people out there who are so skilled in doing so many different things like food industry and um, just, I mean, I can think of a million different um, industries that exist that those folks will be successful um, in, in, this, in, in the tech industry should they be interested because it seems to be the most sustainable during the most challenging times because more people are spending time online and all of that, right? So my goal, you know, your question, Alexa, like what is my plan for professional growth? It's just having spaces like these, getting more conversations like these, figuring out how do we grow as a community, as women, as black, brown, you know, women from different backgrounds. 
and just just keep advancing in that way. I think there's so much power in that. So I intend to continue networking as much as I can to to learn more and uplift others because I know how how hard it is to climb that ladder. Thank you, Linda. That was super powerful. And um, like Brittany said in the chat, networking is a superpower for sure. And I'm so happy you talked about that too um, in your experience too with LinkedIn. Because again, we push LinkedIn and we tell students to get it. And I wish, I always say, I, I wish I knew LinkedIn. I have the same experience um, in my undergrad. I created a LinkedIn for a class and then I never touched it again until my role in this job. And I wish I would have knew now what I knew back then about it and the ways to use it. And I love how you mentioned not only did you you know, get opportunities, you know, offered to you. Um, but you also went out there and looked for them too. And you also reached out and you were like taking me into your own hands. So I just feel like that's super powerful. And I really appreciate you sharing um, your story and how you went from one, like we're not limited, like you're saying, to stay in our lane. Like we can make shifts and jumps and move over to something else um, because we have transferable skills. So not to kind of feel just enclosed in one space. So thank you. That was super powerful. And I appreciate your response so much um, and Jackie as well. And I'm gonna pass it on to Laura who's gonna ask you guys the next couple questions. Before I start, does anyone have any questions that came up to them? I want this to be interactive. I think we all want it to be really interactive. So if anything came up that you're, you can raise your hand, you can type it in chat, you can unmute yourself and just ask a question for Jackie or Linda before I move on, or you can wait till later. Going once. Going twice, okay. Um, so Linda, we're gonna start with you again. In your experience as a woman, what are some challenges when you're planning for upward mobility? Well, I feel like what are, what are the things that are not challenges is like a much easier way to answer that question. Um, I, I think that so I will be very honest. I I grow I grew up in in a country that did not um, celebrate or or encourage women being successful. My mom, my aunties, like there was such a a big uh, focus on on parenting and raising us. And then towards as we started getting older, they started picking up more of like an entrepreneurship spirit, but that was also just like really still new. And so um, I, I have to, I have to say that to start because I think I, I, I'm also, those cultural beliefs are still within me. So I'm constantly feeling like I'm crossing a line that I shouldn't when it comes to how, um, you know, I negotiate for certain things, how I speak up in certain spaces. For most of us on this call, I'm sure we're the only ones in, or, or the few in, in a lot of spaces when, when we're talking to a majority. Um, and so those pieces play a role, right? If I look around the room and I'm like, well, there's no woman in this space or there's no one black in this space or nobody looks like, like nobody, I cannot, nobody's gonna understand what I'm saying. Um, so I'm just gonna take a back seat and, and you know, let this go the way it is because I'm not gonna fight those battles. But over the last um, year or so, I'm pushing past those boundaries um, and, and just being, uh, being aware of what I want, need and deserve. Like we're all in certain spaces because we are qualified, we are deserving. We've gone through a process to get to where we're at. We're smart, we're intelligent beings. And so we should be empowered to speak up. Now, unfortunately, because as a society, like we're in the very, very early stages as it relates to this whole realm of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. At this point, it's an idea, it's a dream, it's a goal, but we don't know how to achieve it. And so when we're in certain spaces and you know, as much as we encourage it, like speak up, say what you think, those biases still play a role. And I'm very much aware, right? Like depending on what my tone is or depending on how much I push on, on, a, on an agenda, I'm aware that the person I'm speaking to could take it a very different way. Um, because we're just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the future. We're just not there yet. We're working towards it. So 
right now, I, I think it's important to, as you're, as you're advocating for yourself or having these conversations about growing professionally and, and uh, some of the issues that come up, of course, like, like I, I just mentioned, these biases, right? We all have biases. I have major biases myself. So those, those are things you have to deal with. Um, being a minority in whatever that capacity of that word means, that would play a role too. Um, the fact that um, a lot of these conversations are new, so that, that's another piece. I would say the, the best thing that has worked for me is having sort of like a board of directors and um, how I define that, it's a group of people that are like your cheerleaders, right? It could be a teacher, it could be uh, a friend, it could be someone you look up to at work, a mentor, somebody, two to three people. So that when you're in a space where you're like, I want to do something I'm not so sure about, I need some sort of like courage those people give you feedback. You're able to go back to them and, and be like, hey, how should I approach this? And, and having a diverse pool of people that you, you consider like your board of directors, they guide you, they give you assurance. Um, and and being, uh, being okay to hearing from them if, if, if they have a critique, it's, it's fine. You know, it's all a learning process. I have found that, um, again, not to go back to networking, but when you build rapport with people, like the people that I fear the most are the ones that I try to make time with. Like, I, I'm like, let's get 15 minutes. Let's just talk about whatever it is. The, if you're able to build rapport with people, most of the time you're able to get what you need. And so if you can spend some time building those relationships and um, getting people to know you, different facets of who you are, I think it's, it's very helpful. And then there's certain scenario, it's, uh, scenarios where that's not possible. And um, I think taking intelligent risks will never fail you. The worst you could ever hear is no. So I, um, and you, I, I walk into spaces knowing that it could be a yes or a no, and I'll take a maybe because at least that I can work with. So don't be afraid. I mean, I just do it. It's one life. I, I've been saying this the past couple of weeks, so I'm going to say it now. We're literally on a floating rock. Like nothing is, should be that complicated. Like it's, it's okay. Most of us are going to be around until like 80s, 90s. So just do it. Whatever it is you want to do, just do it because you only get to do it now. So that's it. Thank you so much, Linda. I, I loved a lot of what you said just about pushing past your brown boundaries, um, thinking about what you want, what you need, what you deserve, but then also kind of with how am I, you know, being aware that the way that you present yourself can be interpreted differently than you mean it to and being kind of aware of that. And then the idea of having your own board of directors that are kind of different people that is just fantastic. That can that can give you guidance, give you feedback, which my husband always says feedback's a gift. Um, so it's, you know, that can be really those honest people and those cheerleaders for you is so important. So Jackie, what would you say as uh, in your experience as a woman, some challenges that you've had when planning for upward mobility? Yeah, I, I loved everything else you said as well, Linda. I think I can relate to a lot of it of the risk taking, kind of stepping out of your comfort zone. I think people hear that a lot, but I think once you're in it and you realize there's a choice between being comfortable and there's a choice when you could be courageous, you kind of just be a little uncomfortable, like go for it because you're right. You only have probably only once one or two times to come across the same opportunity ever again. So one of the challenges I would say you know, in my, in the beginning of my career, and I am sure a lot of folks can relate, like age was probably more of a factor for me than um, being a female, but probably an intersection of both and, and being a minority and being gay, probably all of those mixed together made me feel like the imposter syndrome or a little bit feel like I'm a little bit of an outsider, especially in, you know, in the tech space I was in, I was probably one of two Asian people there. Um, one of two gay people there, one of four women in the whole company. So it, there were times when I definitely felt like self-conscious having an opinion or self-conscious talking about, um, you know, what I thought would be a good recommendation for a project. 
And most of that I would have to attribute to not being confident about like where I stood at the company or what I was doing. And I have to say like that confidence just has to build over time. It's kind of like putting yourself in those positions where you do sit at the table instead of behind everyone, not just because you're the most junior person in the room, but because if you're involved in a project, you are valued just as much as everyone else. And for me, I put probably the challenge of, of being who I was feeling, you know, insecure or not confident. That was a lot on me and, and portrayed in how I, I thought the challenges were coming on to the work that I had or how I showed up. And I think that's something personally that I had to overcome by kind of getting, um, I like how you put it, Linda, like your board of directors. I had a couple of people at the company that were like, you're doing great, Jackie, like, don't worry about it. Um, and sometimes when you just get that little ounce of reassurance that your voice matters, it goes a long way, right? Like it goes, it helps with another presentation. It helps with one more comment that you wanna raise your hand for. Um, and if you can't get that from other folks, sometimes it is like looking at the evidence right in front of you. Like you did work on something, you did accomplish this, you did make more progress. And that, that should just kind of give you a little more, a couple more notches, you know, of, of progress and build some confidence over time. And for me, that, that plays into being a woman and feeling like there might be biases that are portrayed in the workplace or feeling like, you know, sometimes the stereotypes of, you know, men being very assertive and not making space for women's voices. And, and especially now with video calls, you, I feel that sometimes more often when I'm with like product teams or, you know, teams that are a little bit more heavier in, in male, te- uh, male presence, it's usually an unconscious bias or an unconscious action that there's not enough space for everyone to talk, let alone for a woman to talk. So sometimes it is just trying to be a little bit more assertive myself. And I think those challenges are small, but they add up and they uh, also make your day harder if you don't like step up for it every now and then. But I also recognize, you know, a student had asked me one one time, isn't it exhausting to always be a little more assertive and thinking about that every time you're in a meeting? And I said, it is some days, but some days, like, it feels badass to be like, yeah, I like took charge. I spoke my mind, even though I felt a little like worried about it, it ended up working out. You just kind of have to build that confidence over time. And then I think you'll see less less of your gender being an issue. Hopefully every workplace is different. Obviously every team culture is different. Um, But, you know, I think to use Linda's words, find your board of directors, find your support system, find people within your group or company that give you that, that inspiration or that little pat on the back to help you go throughout the day and just know that someone has, has the same point of view or understands that, you know, there's similar struggles. Thank you so much, Jackie. I feel like I got like just little bits over time, like that little, like, oh, it gives you to the next meeting, the next presentation. Like we talk about building a muscle, like interviewing is building a muscle. The more you practice it, the better you're going to get. And just so helpful. Um, and being assertive, I think that's a really hard thing for a lot of people to do. Um, and just the fact that you're saying, just be a little more assertive and then reminding ourselves that, yeah, sometimes it can be badass to be assertive and like step up. That's really cool. So we got a question for both of you guys about what advice, what would be your best advice for networking? And what are some key points to know when you want to network in person or online, for example, on LinkedIn? So Jackie, I'm going to go to you first. So I would say be yourself. I know this sounds really cliche, but like don't network with people based off of just their titles and like what company they work at. Like I would say if if you feel like there's something compelling about maybe the work that you've seen published for them from them or you identify as something similar to m- many interests or profiles that they may have, then have it be authentic because I promise you when you do that outreach, it'll also resonate with them because there's something to relate to. There's a lot of times I personally get all kinds of outreach on LinkedIn, which I try to respond to everyone. But a lot of that, a lot of times it's like they saw a job posting at Google or Netflix and they're like, hey, would love if you referred me. I don't know you. Like, I'm not gonna refer you because a referral is very valuable. Like it means I think you would be great for the company I work at. And I work at this company because I'm working every day to make our mission further, right? And if I don't know you, how do I know make a good team? So sometimes it's like, if you wanna learn about the company or 
what their job is like, have that be your question, have something authentic in, in your outreach. Um, and kind of similar to the last bit that I shared, like it is also kind of being assertive and kind of doing, trying a couple things in terms of how you reach out to folks. Um, don't take rejection personally, usually unless like they have specific feedback for you about the type of outreach that you had, then listen to it and like take into account like what you could do differently. Um, and, and you'll build, you'll build kind of a network of different folks over time. There's, there's some people who, you know, asked for career advice from me, maybe like five years ago, who like I hadn't heard from until they found a new job and they emailed me and they're like, I'm really excited to tell you I, I landed a job that actually, you know, we talked about something similar years ago. And now I kind of found a way here. And I just want to celebrate that and share it with you. I love notes like that, right? And I think keep people in your network because it's a relationship that you want to foster. Don't keep them in your network because one day you'll think you'll find a job and you want them to refer you, right? So it's kind of like how you make friends and relationships in general, just keep it authentic and, and have something relevant for your first outreach versus something that benefits just you. That is so great because I think a lot of people think networking and they're like, oh, I have to be a robotic, but it's totally true. Being authentic and find something they can relate to. Um, I love that you said be okay with rejection. It's going to happen. And then just like you're saying, it's a keep people in your network you want to continue the relationship with, not just that you think you can get something out from them um, was so great. So um, Linda, what about you? Any advice for networking or some key points to know when you're networking online or in person? Yeah, I mean, Jackie covered a lot of a lot of the ones that I had in mind. I will add that um, be clear what you want. Like, you know, early when I started doing this, I would be like, hi, my name is Linda and I've done this and this and that. And it's like this whole paragraph and I would not get a response. And I changed my strategy, you know, on the subject line. You can you can put certain things that are captivating because most of the time, like Jackie said, folks are receiving like multiple, multiple in-mails, like specifically on LinkedIn. And so how do they filter through to pay attention to you? So you want to find a way, you know, as part of being authentic, like Jackie said, like find a way to capture someone's attention. It's the same thing with any, even in, in person, right? And, and professional too. You want to maintain that professionalism because you don't know the person. I have reached out to people that I don't know with just a short like thing or comment like Jackie said about something they posted somebody some huge CEO posted like they were playing a guitar and I reached out and I was like number one that's so dope that you're playing a guitar and you're a whole CEO like a way to make me feel like you're you know just like us um, and it was just very simple and they responded and like followed me and now we're like connected. And to me, I was just like, that was cool. Cause it's like, whoa, this person, we, we connected. I don't need anything from them, but at some point, like, it'll be great. Just having that connection is great to, to, to have, but make sure you know what you're reaching out for. So for instance, if you are reaching out to a recruiter or somebody that posted a specific job, just be very clear. Like I saw you posted this, this is, you know, I'm interested, here's my information, would love to, to contact you. And I think, you know, when I used to send emails, I, it, I spent more time on LinkedIn than I did on, on like, Instagram or any other social media sites because it just became part of my social media practice. It takes time. Most of the time, nobody is going to respond. Sometimes people do when you don't hear back from them. You cannot take it personally. People are busy. People are doing multiple things, but you have to make sure your profile is also attractive enough for someone to want to pay attention to you. Um, and um, yeah, th those are just some key things I, I would mention, but don't be afraid. Again, the last, the, the worst thing someone would say, or they won't respond, or they'll be like, I cannot help you right now. And I've gotten those. And you say, well, thank you. We should stay connected regardless. So, yeah. That's so great. I think 
be clear about what you want. And I think you even talking about the transition of realizing that maybe you don't need to say a paragraph about you, but just something you're curious about them. People like it when you're curious about them instead of making it all about you. Um, so um, we're gonna move on to the next question, but I wanna welcome Mickey Richmond, who's here joining us um, as another panelist. Um, she's the live operation engineer manager at Amazon. And Mickey, we're gonna fold you in with Brittany with the next set of questions. So Brittany, take it away. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, I actually, I'm going to ask Mickey the first question we ask um, everyone else. Um, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself um, and your journey, the work that um, you do that, and the journey that led you where you are now, basically? Sure, um, and my apologies, uh, we had, we're running um, the Miami Open right now, and uh, so we had a couple fires to put out um, here in the uh, in our engineering um, lab. <laughs> so um, so yeah, right. I'm, he, uh, I'm happy to be here with you all. Um, so I started my journey on a completely different path. Um, I went to school and my focus was health administration. And, um, and so when I graduated, you know, I had an internship that turned into a job and then I graduated in the recession. And so that job was eliminated and I actually never worked in healthcare again. And so um, just trying to figure out like what I wanted to do and where I was going to go. Tech was never on my mind. And like, I didn't really have a clear path. You know, I kept knocking at that healthcare door for a while and never really got any opportunities or foot in, in the door in any places. And so I ended up um, going back just to my local community college to take some classes in something that I was interested in, which was video production. So uh, after that, um, I really, I guess we take for granted like the network that we create, even at those very early stages. Um, my instructor in that class, as well as my classmates, um, we kind of, we built like a nice like friendship and like, a, you know, took a lot of guidance from him and some of the other um, people that I was in the class with. So um, I was taking classes off and on um, here and there, like, and I got into editing and post-production. So um, after doing some of that and like creating my own space, freelancing and like creating, um, producing and creating um, instructional videos for different schools and businesses, as well as promotional businesses for some, uh, sorry, promotional videos for small businesses um, in and around the Bay Area in San Francisco. Um, I went back and took one more class. And so my instructor, as we kept in touch, had, you know, a previous student that was hiring. And so he mentioned and connected us. And I really didn't have any other background in technology other than my production work. And so um, I went into that interview and just not being afraid to speak to what you know and not be afraid to, to, to be honest about what you don't know, um, I think was something that I learned in that experience. Um, I was honest about it, but I also knew that I'm the type of person that knows how to get the answer. And that a lot of times is more important than actually the hard skills that, that some jobs may require. So um, I ended up working um, for a streaming company and um, it was just the total basis for my learning. I learned everything on the job from like signal flow and the basics of streaming. Um, and then that company became Disney Streaming Services. So I was there for about four years and worked on, worked on some really cool projects. Um, I was able to um, work in their partner, um, their partner solutions where they were creating and operating apps for other um, companies that were streaming their live sports. So one of those companies was Fox. And so I got to work on like, um, their app that streamed the Super Bowl one year and we streamed with like over a million people, which was super exciting. And we worked on like US Open and like a lot of like really big um, streaming, um, streaming uh, events that were, you know, 
seen worldwide. So just like having that, um, that experience of like how to handle yourself in those situations, um, you know, it brought me to the next opportunity, which was working on the Disney Plus app in some of their incident management, um, their incident management teams. And so I was able to touch a lot of products in a different way. It's not just in the traditional developer or coder kind of way. Um, so I think like the biggest thing was for me to just take those opportunities as they came. And, um, and so I just started saying yes, even though it always wasn't, you know, the you know, it always didn't pay off in the, you know, most tangible way, um, but it allowed me to touch things that were, would then give me the, the platform and like the ability to say that I can do more based on being responsible for this part of this major thing. Um, and so just this past uh, February, um, I came over to Amazon to help manage and grow their um, live streaming team. And so that's where I am right now. I'm actually in the office. Um, it was a great opportunity. So that's how I got here. I know it's not at all traditional. And um, that's the thing that like, I never saw myself in tech, but like, that's one reason why I really like the tech industry is because sometimes, you know, you don't necessarily have to have all of the hard skills to be able to tap into that community and into that um, industry. And you really can, with a lot of like help and a lot of um, opportunity, which is there, you can like kind of navigate yourself into a, a, a career that you might not have traditionally seen for yourself. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, so our next question is about imposter syndrome. Um, the imposter syndrome, simply put, is just feeling like you don't belong, that you are pretending you're, that you're, you're there, that you're not qualified, and you feel like somebody's going to find you out any day, that um, this isn't your place. And so, Jackie, have you ever dealt with or experienced um, imposter syndrome? And if so, how did you kind of get through it? Um, yeah, and excuse me if like there's construction just started right outside my house. Can is it? Can you guys hear me? Okay, you Perfect. can hear. It. Okay, it's like a saw happening. Um, so yeah, I kind of touched a little bit on imposter syndrome earlier about kind of age and some of the challenges as as a woman. But I do think that especially now, I think um, as Miki or Mikey, I'm sorry, I didn't get the pronunciation of your name. You mentioned that like in tech, a lot of things are kind of changing and you're taking risks. I think, you know, there's a lot of that feeling of, I don't know enough, or I don't know as much as I should about this product area or this technical piece or all the elements of that the company might have. And so sometimes I get that imposter feeling when I'm in a meeting where it feels like everyone else might know more. But I do think that in those situations, it is really good to admit what you need to find out about and what you need to learn and what you're able to kind of dig into with different with different folks. I think like there's a lot of sense that in technology, especially we're doing a lot of things that like no one's been doing, right? Like a lot of the businesses we work on now are kind of in stages where there's growth. There's a lot of different product development, like based off of what's going on in the world today. So I don't think anyone would have known we'd all be ditching DVDs so quickly, for example, for streaming. So like no one's actually worked in these spaces, but the, their skills that transferred from other projects we've all worked on that kind of helped us get to where we are. And so when it goes, to, goes back to imposter syndrome, like I think I was always like quick to admit what I didn't know and was willing to learn. And what I did know, I was super confident about and was like, hey, like this could really help this project. Like, let's keep pushing on this or that, right? And I think that's what's kind of helped me feel more confident in certain situations to kind of defeat that imposter syndrome a little bit of like protecting what I do know and being able to kind of contribute and add value in that way. But also, you know, build others up around you who might feel that imposter syndrome too. I also noticed that with, you know, some of the newer folks that and more junior folks coming out of school and kind of coming onto the teams, I really do help try to help them like have a voice or to, to know that, you know, their opinion matters. And I can see the imposter syndrome kind of seep in sometimes and they physically don't like want to be involved or feel comfortable being involved. So 
it's all also an element of community around helping people feel more belonging and inclusion. And I think that can help with imposter syndrome as a whole too. Thank you, that is uh, so relevant um, and relatable. And I wanted to pass to Mickey, if you'd like to um, kind of pick up that question, if you've ever felt dealt with um, imposter syndrome. Yeah, um, I think um, like this is totally exactly the way I was feeling. Um, I think every time you get to a point where you're ready to grow and you're like ready for the next step and like you, you think you've done all the things to prepare you and then that door like opens, you're like, oh my God, <laughs> they really chose me. Oh my God, like what? Um, so like I totally was experiencing that when I came over to Amazon. Um, you know, it's, it's like that first step when you like step out on your own and you're just like, I can do this. And then someone's like, well, here, do it. Um, you get that fear um, inside that you aren't good enough or like, why'd they pick me? Or did they only pick me because I'm a woman? Um, I work in on a team with probably about 80% men. And like every one of my direct report, every one of my 16 direct reports are men. And that coupled with the imposter syndrome that I was feeling about like what is it like can I live up to what they expect of me can I can I deliver what they think that I I know right because there's the whole process you go to with interviewing or you know preparing yourself taking classes passing tests getting certifications and then there's the actual work that you do like and you produce um, I would say the way that I dealt with it is to remind myself that I got here because of this because I have something that this organization or this person or this group needs, right? I never thought like even being on this panel, I was like, no one wants to hear from me, <laughs> you know? But even like having that awareness of where, okay, I'm feeling this and then I'm gonna let it go because I know that I have value to add to the situation or the group that I'm, I'm going into or I'm, I'm a part of. Um, remembering that even if you don't see the value in what it is that you know or what you bring, someone else sees that. And, and if you're feeling that imposter syndrome, it's just a matter of you self-evaluating to be sure that you feel confident in the things that you bring to the table. So I think when you, when you reflect on what, what it is that, you know, what it is that got you to where you are and, and where you wanna go, you start to be able to name out those things. Yes, um, I like to develop people or yes, I do this well. And no, I don't know. I work in an industry where everyone is a coder or a developer and I am not at all that, but I am a great um, people manager. I am a great team builder. I am a person that knows how to support people who do the technical things to make sure that they have the space to be successful. Those things are important and not everyone has that skill. So just identify those things that make you special, that, that you know that you are bringing to the table. The things that are missing in the places that you're stepping into, that's what, that's what will help you get over that those feelings of imposter syndrome, because we all have, we all deserve to be in those rooms that we make it into. Don't, just don't let yourself fall into the, you know, the cycle of that um, imposter syndrome. Thank you, that is such great advice. Um, and Linda, I want to give you the opportunity as well, if you'd like to share any um, times insight that you've had to deal with um, imposter syndrome. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> I think Jackie and Mickey have covered it extensively. I would add that I didn't know what imposter syndrome was until, like, I, I would have that feeling of, am I, do they, should I be here? Am I qualified to be here? And uh, with the shift from nonprofit to tech, I started feeling it more and more. And I work in engineering. I don't know anything about engineering, let me tell you, nothing, right? But like Mickey said, it, these, you know, there's certain skill sets that we, all of us possess. Not everyone has the same skills. That's, that's the beauty of a team. Everyone brings something unique to the table that other people may not have. But I didn't know what 
imposter syndrome was. I just knew that I would be in spaces and I'd be like, I'm not going to say anything because what if I say it and people are going to think that what I'm saying is silly. And, um, you know, I had to work through that. And um, by the time you're at the table, you have already been qualified to be at the table. So you have to remember that you're not interviewing still, you're not being considered. You are a decision maker, you're a stakeholder, you are, a, you're part of the team. And um, I started just asking questions and um, figuring ways to increase that um, professional self-esteem on subjects that I felt like, I don't know much about that, let me ask um, and let me learn. And I think the more, everything is like a muscle, right? The more you work it out, the stronger you get. I definitely have moments where I'm just pure in the middle of being an imposter. And those are the moments that I think about, um, you know, these, uh, if anyone practices affirmations, like I go back to who I am, what do I bring to the table? Why am I here? Like think of all the positive traits that you bring. It's unfortunate, like as women, sometimes we have to go to that place. My partner, when I talk to him about this stuff, he's like, what do you mean imposter syndrome? Like he has no idea. He's like, that guy was just wrong. I'm like, ah, <laughs> that's how you think about it? Okay, great. Because I have overcalculated how I could have done it. This would have been a better way. But acknowledging it and just taking care of yourself, like it's okay. We have eight, some of us plus hours in a day. It's fine. Tomorrow is always a, a, a different day. But I think... Um, I think acknowledging what it is and um, not letting it define you because you're not defined by that. You've already gotten the job. You, or you've already got, whatever it is, the thing is that's making you feel like an imposter, you're already in it. So if you remember that, it's just much easier. Thank you. Um, and I'm not seeing any questions um, in the chat, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Laura. Thank you. So this is going to be our last formal question. So if you do have questions, we're going to open it up after my question, after the panelists answer, and we're welcome, happy to have you guys ask questions. So this is kind of a hard question, um, but how have you dealt with gender bias or gender feedback? So an example a coworker gave us is um, she's, someone told her that to be move up in the company, she needed to smile more, which we imagine that that wouldn't feedback have come to a man. So have you dealt with it and how have you dealt with it? And I'm going to start with you, Linda. And I, I see a look like, hmm, I have to think about that. So no, I'm thinking of the best scenario to share that was that is appropriate. Um because that has happened. Uh I think I mentioned it earlier. So earlier in my career, I was just this like bouncy ball, just like I I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that and try and stop me. And I would just there was no filter in how I approach situations. I can definitely tell the older I get, the more I'm like, okay, I'm going to focus on this. And I'm, you know, and uh, one thing that I used to be told a lot was um, uh, there's, a, there's a sense of compassion on how I do things. And it's, it works in my favor, really. If I walk into spaces with, with compassion, things work well. And I used to be told, like, you will not advance unless you are the B word. Like, you have, that's what you have to be to be successful. And, um, like, that's how you move things. And I remember being told that, like, earlier in my career. And I tried, you know, I did try to be that person. I did try to, like, be extremely like walk in and you know like the devil wears Prada right like I tried to find my inner Meryl Strip every day and I failed miserably because it's just not in my style now don't get me wrong some people it works really well but my biggest thing in that instance was I don't need people to fear me I want people to respect me um, and I feel like respect comes easier when people really understand. Um, there's, there's like clear understanding of 
what boundaries exist and what expectations are. I don't need people to like scatter away when I walk in because I actually enjoy the company of people. And so I would say that was one I heard. I also was told, um, uh, yeah, you, you need to be more, I think one, one, I had a boss, it was a guy and he was like, uh, sometimes when you're in meetings, you know, you, you need to, you need to not seem so angry if things don't go your way. So, and it's like, well, you get to storm out of a meeting and I can't like close my notebook, you know, aggressively, quote unquote. So, I mean, the list goes on. Uh, again, industries are different. Nonprofit was cutthroat. It was just a lot of, you know, so... But whatever you do, you you find your you find what works for you, and often it's about believability. You need people to believe who you are, and you need to believe who you are. And whatever that process is, it's gonna work for you, um, depending on, on on how you're practicing it. But compassion, just be nice, just be kind to people. Whatever that kindness is, figure it out, and 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 lead with compassion. Uh, it's yet to fail me. So. That is so great. I love, I don't need people to fear me. I just want people to respect me. It's such a good lesson from that. And I know, okay, so Linda might have to hop off at 410. So we just want, oh. I will stay. I just told my team out because this is, this is important. So I'll stay. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to Jackie. So same question. Have you dealt with gender bias and gendered feedback? Yes. Yeah, so uh, probably the most obvious examples that come to me are when I was in Asia. So I was working at the Singapore office, but I was actually traveling to a lot of other countries for partnership meetings. So a lot of the work I do, I'm actually in, in person, well, pre-COVID, in person with partners talking through marketing plans and whatnot. And in Asia, uh, I think there's like a generalization that a lot of folks in leadership positions are typically ma men and there's like different cultural structures professionally in like places like Korea and Japan and other places that I was traveling to. So I was like really worried about being kind of uh, like a non-feminine woman who like was a maybe kind of confusing to people in in different meetings. So I would like lean into wearing like more masculine clothing, even though, yes, I lean a little bit more masculine in some of my gender expression, but like I am feminine as well at times, but I felt like I needed to be something that made sense to people and I wasn't feminine enough. And I also do feel like because I, I was starting to see that there was like the way that certain women were treated. And even for me, like I, I wasn't sure if what was the right thing to do in terms of which gender expression to choose. So like I had to feel out my way there. And I think some of the meetings that were, I were in was in because I kind of leaned more masculine presenting, like when we would go out to partner dinners, I remember some of my, you know, partners who were on the other side, we would have dinners and we would, you know, have drinks at happy hour and they would be like egging me on to drink with them more because I was like kind of one of the guys and like I was trying to be very professional and then they were like expecting the other women to like go home early and didn't invite them out to the rest of the night and because it was like a business partnership and a lot of like the cultural norms especially in places like Korea and Japan was like you continue to kind of go with it and you you drink together or eat together um, and I felt like the pressure to kind of do that as far as like men wanted me to do that with them. And so I had to like really figure out what was the right mix for me and like respect like my female colleagues as well. And also embrace that like I was a woman in a position to make decisions and influence how they treated us. So like, I really did have to kind of do some internal reflection on like what was the right way to approach those situations even with that pressure that was put on us and having to draw boundaries was a really important thing. So I wouldn't keep going out after a certain amount of time or I wouldn't keep drinking just because the pressure was on me to do that. And still like expected that the next day that we would have like a productive meeting and conversation about whatever the deal was. And I think that 
that was a hard journey because it was like figuring out how to respect the cultural norms, but also how to respect my own personal boundaries and my female colleagues who were in the same situation. Um, I remember that feeling like so obviously about gender that it was it was a really hard challenge and had to like really lean on some colleagues to figure out the right approach as well. That is so great. I, I just love that you had to say what was right for, I had to figure out what was right for me. And also you realizing you were in a privileged position and so you could do what's right for you, but also you needed to respect your colleagues, your female colleagues and not, maybe you were in a position of power. So that's really great and sounds like a really hard place to be in. So thank you for sharing that. Mickey, um, how have you dealt with gender bias and gendered feedback? Right. Um, I think the the way that I've experienced it um, has been, um, I guess, not being taken seriously for opportunities to grow. So um, being that like tech is still predominantly, you know, a male industry um, and, you know, coming in on the entry level, you know, the, the track for, for growth um, can be more difficult to navigate for women. And that's just true. And that's why we have spaces like this to talk about that and get guidance, right? Um, so I remember a time where I'd been working and, you know, doing great. And I was just finding myself, um, I was looking around at my colleagues and my peers, and I just started to notice like, people were moving in this direction and people were, you know, getting promoted and moved over to like these more like involved teams. And that it was like, people were finding their specialties and things like that. And like, I was seriously just not moving at all with no prospects, no, like, Oh, you know, like no conversations going, none of that kind of stuff. And it really discouraged me. Cause I was like, well, what is the issue? Like, is it me? Am I not? smart enough? Do I not know enough? Like, what's the issue? So I took it first, you know, I did the self-reflection about like where I stood um, in, uh, in my abilities and like the skills that I had. And once I shored those up, not that they were lacking so much, but once I like, you know, really investigated that and made sure that that wasn't, you know, the reason or the thing that was holding me back, um, you know, I'm still seeing this thing happen around me. And I won't say that it was easy, but it really took like clearly calling it out to the people that were my management above me. And it is the hardest thing to do when you have to like have that conversation about like, listen, I see this happening and this is my colleague and this is my colleague and they are given these opportunities and I am not. And I would like to know why that is. That was a very difficult conversation that I had to have at least three times with three different people. And so I don't feel like anyone should feel that they can't ask that question because sometimes people are just not aware and I, I'm willing to give anyone the benefit of that doubt, right? But then there, there are times where it needs to be brought to light so that like there can be more transparency and um, opportunity for everyone, you know? So like Jackie was saying, like it was her responsibility or she felt it was her responsibility to act in a certain way or, or be in and, and um, you know, use the situation in, in a way that was, conducive not just to her own, you know, comfortability, but to like the, the standard that would be set throughout for women in her position. And I think that a lot of us don't, don't know the power that we have in those moments or in those situations that sometimes it is your voice that is the one that is the change, you know, and it can be brought to light. So from that situation, um, you know, I was seeing all these, and the, most of them were men, and they were being like pulled to these other teams and, you know, given promotions and things were all around me. And that was how I, con I was able to get some more leverage in getting on the teams that I did get on. Um, and I am by no means like this, you know, 
super boisterous. Like I just really nice. And I feel like sometimes people don't take me seriously because I am like accommodating and, you know, flexible and those things that make me me, but it doesn't mean that I don't um, want to excel or, or want, you know, that career growth that I want to see for myself. So I think like it's, there's no, um, no limit to speaking up and calling it out um, in the most professional way that you can. Um, if that's the situation and you are really hitting a, a wall that you can't get around. I would also say to lean into um, finding people around you that can support you. Like even if um, even if it's a, a person that you can talk to, um, or, a, an ally or, or, or just an ear, like lean into that because I guarantee that you're not the only person that feels the way that you do, no matter what the situation is, whether it's gender bias or, you know, whatever it might be in your situation. Um, I was able to do that with other women on my um, team. And so we created, you know, a, a community around, having those spaces to speak up for each other and like back each other up when time was needed to do that as well. So. That is so great. I, I think the thing that stood out for me, as you said, I had to have that difficult conversation three times with three different people, like the bravery that took to do that. And also realizing, like you said, your voice can, can be the change. Um, so I'm opening it up to questions. Um, if anyone wants to unmute or put it in the chat or raise their hand, um, we want to make sure if you have burning questions that you are able to ask our wonderful panelists before we close out. And I did want to say there was a, um, a comment uh, there, uh, from CU saying thank you so much for the um, imposter question uh, answer. Um, uh, she said she's heard of it but never really understood it and I have that feeling most of the time and now I can put a name on it and I will think more about uh, what I can bring to the table and turn my negatives into my strength. Uh, so I did want to read that if you missed it in the chat. And um, Mickey actually answered a question I was going to ask, which was um, about uh, being a woman in the workplace when you're doing so well um, and that you're you have the appearance of such a strong, valued employee but you will all constantly be passed over for promotions and even mentoring opportunities and not realize that even um, strong so-called women need that support as well. Um, and it definitely, it's, it's interesting to watch um, because they're, they're, not, they're okay with leaving you in your current position because you're too valued in that spot to be able to allow you to grow um, further into your own career. I did want to thank you for answering that. And if uh, Linda or Jackie had any comments on on that and wanted to expand, or if you had any um, side notes you wanted to say. Yeah, I actually have a, a note on the imposter syndrome piece that I totally think is relevant for this group just because we're speaking to students specifically. Is I went to a state school. I put myself through school. I was the second one in my whole family to do it. My parents are refugees from Vietnam. And I didn't think that I would be able to do it. And I didn't think that I'd be in the room with folks who went to Harvard and Yale and Stanford. And I even managed folks from Ivy Leagues. And I always thought that I just wasn't going to get the right opportunities coming from a public school. And I have to say, we're here. <laughs> we're in these positions. There are opportunities. Uh, folks want to hear from you. Folks want to help folks want to give opportunities to people who haven't had them before. It's just about having the ability to network and know that the needs there, but also like everyone, Linda and Nikki have kind of mentioned, like finding your support, finding the things that you're good at, figuring out skills that are true to you and like your personality and how you want to, you know, reach out to folks. That's going to help you find the opportunities that are out there. And also like knowing like what you want is helpful too, because then people can help you get there. Um, like I would say like, I didn't know like a lot of these positions were gonna come up for me. It was just like a matter of kind of being in, in my focus on the things that I was doing and just grinding as I went. And like 10 years later, I have a career that I didn't think I could have. So I think there's, there's an imposter syndrome I have 
probably weekly, sometimes in meetings where I'm like, how did I get here? Right. And I didn't go to any of these fancy schools. I didn't, you know, I didn't have the same opportunities as I thought, you know, a lot of other folks did. And, you know, we all have something different to offer. Um, so just putting it out there for imposter syndrome, I still feel it. And sometimes it's still thinking about where I went to school and how I got to where I am. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I, I, when you work in this industry and people are like, oh, I went to MIT, I went to Harvard, I went and I went to a small school in Northern, I mean, Southern Virginia that nobody's ever heard of. And it's like, how do you even plug yourself in there? Or people are like, oh, I was part of the Stanford cohort that started Facebook or something. It's just like, it's so, you're like, I am from a small village in Kenya. You know, that's that's my contribution. Um, but I, even that, whatever it is that you, I think what, what helps, and Jackie's so right, every, at least every week, there's a moment where I'm like, I see it. I see the imposter syndrome creeping in. I call it out, be aware, be present, and then find the things that define you because the imposter syndrome does not define you. It's, it's, um, it's a reaction to being in a space where you feel like you're the only. So if you're in that space, once you leave, like I'll say what I said earlier, find your click, find your community, find your people. I always jump on a call with those people and I'm like, some of them are on my calls. I'm like, did y'all feel that? Or is that just me? And they're like, we felt it, sis. Let's process. And I think that helps you because you're like, I'm not the only one. This isn't, but don't stay in that space too long. Like be aware, be present, keep, keep moving. Um, someone told me men feel imposter syndrome, but it's very different. I think that the whole concept of being an imposter, it's shared, but we are just vocal about it as women, like we talk about it. Um, but it's something Jackie said that I want to repeat because they are students on the call. I swear, it doesn't matter where you go to school. It doesn't matter what you do in advance. All that matters is how, how, how much you want what you want and how hard you work towards it. And sometimes it's just being at the right place. And so these pressures of like, you've got to go to this school, you've got to do this and you've got just be, find something, do it and do it passionately, learn a skill, whatever it is, people will, and if you do the right networking and connections, people will identify you. Everything just kind of lines up at that point, but don't let these, um, expectations society expectations define you they are so useless honestly yeah i would also add like definitely well said um when people say like your network really matters it really does but i don't want like when i was in school it was very hard for me to talk to people and like get that jump started it's really not that hard, I promise you. Um, someone told me when I was a little bit after college, if you feel lost and you're in a networking situation um, and you don't know what to talk about, you don't know how to approach people, if you think about a question, a compliment or a comment on something someone says, that'll give you at least the jump start to, to break that you know cycle of fear to interact. Um, it helped me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not excellent at it, but I'm not afraid of it anymore. So that's really helped me. All the opportunities you have to network like these and um, take those and follow up with them because it really does help you at least branch out to more possibilities because each and every person you come in contact with is a potential opportunity somewhere down the line. It's a matter of like, how you grow that connection. And so that really helped me be able to expand. Um, one thing that was really helpful that a friend suggested was to uh, do informational interviews with people that are connected to your network. So maybe it's not you ask someone like, hey, can you, I really wanna to talk to you about this specific thing. Maybe it's, 
hey, do you know someone in this field that I could talk to about what it's like to work in it? And then that takes the pressure off of that person to deliver or to say no or to say yes. And maybe they can like take some time and think about where they can best fit you. And maybe they might be the right person, maybe they might not, but then you have another connection that you've made. So like, I know it's super scary, especially when you're like in college and you're a student and you're just getting into these situations where you have to make connections and you need to, you know, um, build those bridges between people and new connections. But it's like, once you get through the fear of like, oh my God, what am I gonna say? Like, just break that, that cycle of fear and then just connect every now and then, you know, like just come back to those people every month and say, hey, just checking in with you, hope all's well, whatever it might be. But like your network really does help you in um, just at least trying and, and getting out of your comfort zone really does make a difference. Um, and I invite anyone who wants to connect, like I'm always open to it. I may not like get right back to you at the moment, but uh, feel free to connect with me and I hope that you all make all the connections you need to get where you want to be. Thank you all so much. Um, we've come to our closing, um, but I just want to thank you again and I thank, you know, our panelists of professionals here today with us. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, uh, Mickey, for being here. Um, it, Fantastic your presentation. Fantastic presentation. Oh, fan yes. And I was going to say it was such an invaluable experience. Um, the advice that you've given us. Um, and yes, and I, I feel like I can speak on everybody a little bit here when we say this was just been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to and for you to open up and share your personal experiences with us um, and give us some insight on, you know, how we anticipate to work ourselves through our own careers and make the choices in our life and not feeling, um, just confined, right, in a way where we can't grow and we can't move as women or even just in general within these companies um, that just seem so far from our reach but are really just right there. So I really, really appreciate you coming and taking time today um, to share these, these stories with us. And I did want to shout out the career readiness and job placement team here, our job placement coordinators for coordinating this. My uh, few of the people on my board, right? Love them. <laughs> They're, you know, always there for me too. So that's, I love them for that. And um, this session is recorded. So just some little logistics before we go, the session is recorded. It will be uploaded into our website, which we will share with you all um, once we do get that uploaded and running. And we do understand that we are living in, you know, some very challenging times, but we do want you to continue to feel empowered and to feel confident in your career development. And that's why we continue to try to create these spaces and get wonderful people like we have here today um, to come and share their experiences and really just let you know that this, this can be a reality for you. So please visit our website um, and feel free to email us if you have further questions or maybe questions come up later and we can reach out to the panelists um, of professionals here today, or you can connect on LinkedIn. I know I will be connecting with you guys on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm super excited for that. And thank you, just thank you so much everyone for coming. And we have about three minutes. So if there's anyone who has some last thoughts, wanna say anything, um, please feel free to, to do so. And I'm gonna go ahead and, sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and jump because I'm super, super late to my- Hi, Linda. <laughs> thank, thank you for you. staying. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. So, thank you, it was so nice to meet all the new people and seeing the folks I know already. And um, yeah, let's let's take over, y'all. We, we can do this, let's do it. <laughs> Appreciate you all. Yes. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Ms. Powell's here. Hey, Ms. Powell. Hello, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the team, Alexa, Laura, Renee, Brittany, um, for organizing this, Jackie, and um, is it Mickey? All right, and, and all the speakers on here, I really appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I love when the chat is active. Oh. <laughs> I've never seen a chat so active. It was awesome. <laughs> And if you have any questions, bye everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks bye. so much. Bye, Appreciate bye everyone. It. Thank, Thank you all. all.